has those components is to achieve those goals. You know, let's keep our eyes on the prize, as they say. Let's keep our focus on why it is we're creating the website in the first place. And that is to achieve our goals and to help our customers or our users achieve their goals as well. Oh, I was so worried you guys weren't going to be here. <laughs> All right. Whew. Uh-oh. So, things like a clear navigation. That's good, but why is it good? It's good because it helps us achieve our goals. If you can't find the stuff on the site, then you can't achieve your goal. So we're going to have that as our focus, achieving the goals. Everything else, all the other things that are typically described as good design principles, fall into place once you keep that in place, right? A consistency of appearance. Yeah, it's easier to find things. It's easier to achieve your goals if, it's, if it is uh, consistent. Um, have it reflect the organization's brand. Well, yeah, that's obviously every organization has an image that they want to portray, and it's a goal of theirs for the website to portray that image. So, yeah, that fits in there as well. What I like about this in addition is it doesn't separate content from design. Sometimes people talk about a website as though you can, you can look at it from a design perspective and from a content perspective. It has good content but poor design. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you can. <coughs> But in my mind, an aspect of design is choosing the proper content to appear on the site. All right? Too little content and users can't achieve their goals. Too much content and users may not be able to achieve their goals. So I kind of like this holistic goal achieving perspective as a perspective for a well-designed website. So therefore, First and foremost in defining a website and designing a website is to define the goals. We're not going to do that. Because apparently, I tried before class, no matter what you do, there's always two slivers of light right there. So I'll, I'll pop open a Word document instead. <laughs> Well, if this doesn't work, we'll go to that. So our first step is going to be to define goals. And remember, goals exist both for the organization that's creating the website and for the different groups of users. All right. It's best to be spe as specific as possible, and it's best to be as content-oriented as possible when you define this. So for example, a goal is not for your website to have good navigation. All right? Does that mean that you don't want your website to have good navigation? No. But that's not why people are coming to visit your site. All right? They're not coming to visit your site to be dazzled by the interesting, effective navigation that you have. All right? They're coming to your site to get some information or to do something or whatever and that is their goal. The good navigation helps support that. All right? It's not a goal unto itself. So these goals are not simply basic web design principles. But are specific to your project. As specific as possible is better still. All right. This helps you go and take a topic that could be broad and narrow it down 
to a much better focus, right? much tighter focus. I had a student in one of my other classes talk about doing their project about Jeeps. And it's like, okay, that's, that's, a, that's a potentially good idea. But really, Jeeps, what about Jeeps? All right, the history of the Jeep, how it's used in military, um, how to go on outdoor adventures with Jeeps, how to repair a Jeep, a buying guide to Jeeps. All these are very different things and very different aspects of the general topic of Jeeps. So what you're doing is you're narrowing the topic in, that you're not going to talk about everything about this particular topic, but you're going to focus on one thing. All right? Notice also, as part of this, part of this project, is identifying the groups of users that you're going to be attracting or trying to attract. All right? If I was going to do a site about um, music, music appreciation site, well, no, let me rephrase that. If I was going to do a site about music, my audience could be musicians. My audience could be people that are sophisticated listeners already. My audience could be kids that, you know, only listen to this newfangled stuff, and we're going to teach them about some real music. All right? And anywhere in between. Now, we can sort of see with this that it's going to be difficult to be all things to all people. That's why you try right in advance to sort of narrow your scope and identify really what's important to you. Now, again, a lot of it has to do with why you're creating the site. You know, if, for example, I was a music shop and I was creating this site, obviously one of my goals is to have more people visit my shop and buy instruments and other stuff from me. So that would be one of my goals and that would help push me in the direction of am I dealing with professional musicians or student musicians or whatever. All right. Pardon me? Hipsters, yeah, exactly. All right. So when we go and define these goals, again, we're really narrowing the scope from a broad topic to a narrower topic and we're defining our audience. Now, almost any site you can think of, one, one flaw, one mistake that people make when they start talking about web design is they start talking about the user as though the user is one person out there that has one set of goals. Really, there's going to be any number of different target audiences for your website. Not all your users are the same, and not all of them have the same goals. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about the college website. There are what I'll call traditional college students, you know, st students that have just finished high school. There are adult learners. There are parents of students. There are businesses looking for ways of, of retraining and re-educating their employees, and so on down the line. There's members of the community that aren't necessarily interested in getting a degree, but have some special interests and might want to enrich their self by taking a class, or even aren't interested in classes at all, but want to know about some of the activities that happen on campus, the film society, concert series, and so on. So all of these form a distinct group of users. All right? We're going to do that one better, and this sounds a little hokey, all right? but we're going to create fictional people. All right? We're going to just make up people. And we're going to give them a name, and we're going to make up a little story about them. And they're going to be representative of our different user groups. Why do we do this? We do this to sort of put a face on our user out there. 
So we're not thinking of the user as just being one person, one faceless person out there that, you know, represents everyone that could possibly visit our site. We're going to break down our user population into a few groups. Now, to be sure, is that accurate? No. In reality, all right, in reality, you know, there are what? Seven, eight billion people in the world. Each one has their own set of unique needs and interests and so on. All right? But you can't come up with a plan for all eight billion of them. All right? So what you're going to do is you're going to define sort of two or three groups and look at what their specific goals are. So again, not as good as developing a website for an individual, but that's totally impractical. However, it's better than just looking at our users as just one group of people. So we're going to create these personas, and we're going to make up some characteristics, and that will help us define goals for different groups of people. All right. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up a design document that I prepared. All right, I created um, a sample design document a few years back, and it's not meant to be perfect. All right. It'll be interesting, especially now with the health issues I have, if someone were to turn this in verbatim, what kind of grade I'd give them. You know, I'm not guaranteed 100 percent. I'm not guaranteeing it's perfect. But I think it illustrates some points that are important. Here's a sample plan. And open that up. I'm also going to open up this guy. All right. The first section of your design document is the strategy section. And in the strategy section, you define the goals. All right? After strategy comes your tactics for achieving those goals. So you define your goals, and you look at how you're going to achieve those goals. And again, both these things are things specific to your project. We're not talking about basic design principles. You're not achieving your goals by having good navigation. All right. In other words, someone visits Elsie's website, and the goal is to see if they want to go here. Chances are the person is going to say, this website has such outstanding navigation on it that I am going to enroll and become a student here. Almost did. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, if anything, the opposite could be true. And it's not so much even that you would come out and say that, that like, I'm not going to enroll in this college because I don't like their website. But if you can't find the stuff that you're looking for, you'll give up, right? And you're like, oh, I wonder what tri C's offering. I wonder what Cleveland State's offering or something along those lines, all right? Um, so at any rate, we define um, our goals in here. And I give a little overview of why I'm creating the site and my topic. And I'm narrowing down my audience. All right. I'm talking about jazz as um, my favorite form of music. And many people are not familiar with it. <laughs> Aim to create a site for people that don't know a lot about jazz and learn about uh, and they, where they can learn about it geared towards listeners and not musicians, and novices as opposed to experts. So my goal 
is to come up with something, again, for, not necessarily for musicians and not necessarily for expert listeners. If you, you know, just trust me on this, if you, um, like, read some jazz magazines, they will talk about, like, alternate takes of a particular tune, whereas someone did uh, two versions of a song on a given day. And they will discuss at great detail the strengths and weaknesses of those. You know, even me, who I consider myself kind of a serious fan, sometimes my eyes glaze over a little bit, you know. Because it's just that, like, I'm not a musician. I probably don't appreciate all the intricacies uh, of all that. And that's just a little too heavy for detail. Information like that would intimidate a novice listener and would confuse them and, if anything, would push them away from the music. All right? Musicians would eat that up. Experienced listeners, in some cases, would eat that up. But that's not the target, that's not the group of people that I'm going with. So, I define the goals. Broaden the popularity of jazz. Expand horizons. Introduce them to musicians which are not familiar. And to give an overview of the whole history of jazz from beginning until now. The user's goals. Find other musicians similar to musicians they already like. To find biographical background information about jazz musicians. To get information that will assist them in building a jazz record library. So I've identified three goals for each group. All right, users and the organization. I then have a blank page. I have a, a blank space. No, this is not a Taylor Swift website. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Uh, <laughs> and I actually have the personas. And I actually went and got pictures of people uh, that are licensed under Creative Commons. All right. You can use your friends, your enemies, uh, I mean, whatever. You, you can use celebrities. You can make up stories. Have fun with it. All right, why not? But I went and I created a little bit of a little suit of these people. But he really kind of moved away from it. And now that he's getting older, he's, he's interested in rediscovering the music and learning about contemporary jazz. So this person might be sort of familiar with some of the musicians of the past, but really lost their way and isn't familiar with current musicians. This person, Mary Nelson, all right, taking a music appreciation class, all right, she knows almost nothing about jazz, but enjoys some of the music played in class. It's like, I like this, I want to hear more. All right. She needs some information about jazz for a report in her class and doesn't know where to begin. And so on. And then Bob Jones has had friends that listen to it and blah, blah, blah. Now, why do we do this? We do this as sort of an exercise to put ourselves in the shoes of the person viewing the site. All right? So in other words, if we're looking at designing the way our site is going to look and the structure and the layout of the pages and all that, we don't ask, is that way of organizing our site is that good for the user? We ask, is it good for Bob? Is it good for Mary? Is it good for Frank? Well, I'm try I was trying to remember the names I picked. I don't know if I remember them all. Bob, Mary, and Brad. I'm sorry, I, Brad. I don't know. They, they, do have, they do have all names of jazz musicians, not the first name, but the last name. Charlie Parker, Oliver Nelson, and any number of Joneses. No. I, I, it's not a matter of liking or not liking. He's, he was not the person that this was named after. 
Thad Jones, uh, 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 Joe Jones, um, not from the Jonas Brothers. Oh, okay. Tones for Jones Bones. Quincy Jones, there you go. All right. Right, yeah, we... All right. So we do this, we do this so we can put ourselves in the shoes. And again, this is a small example, right? In your examples, your projects are going to be small. But still, no matter what topic you consider, you can think of personas or groups of people that might need different stuff or different organization of the material or whatever to get their goals uh, achieved. Now we talked last time about for a college site. Students, parents of students, older students, transfer students, those being personas. So if you're doing it for a college site, you would probably have more than three personas. You'd have a bunch of them. And as you were designing things, you'd look. How does it work for Mark the transfer student? How does it work for Joe the older learner? How does it work for uh, Mary and Pete, the parents of a high school senior? And so on. Let's think of a few other examples. Let's say that I was, doing, um, I was doing a site for an athletics goods store, a sporting goods store. You know, I, I have to say, I, I remember sporting goods store when they actually sold sporting goods as opposed to a bunch of just team sweatshirts and stuff. But let's imagine we can go back in time to a store that actually sells sporting goods. Who would be, who could be different personas for that? Pardon me? In extreme enthusiast Emily. Okay, very good. And I like the imagination. All right. Someone that was into the sport. All right. Someone that was already a golfer, rock climber, kayaker, whatever and really wants, you know, some high-end stuff, all right? What's another persona? Soccer mom Sarah. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and what does soccer mom Sarah want? To buy stuff for her kids. Well, the, the best that's, that soccer mom Sarah can afford because, you know, it's been hard times for soccer mom Sarah, right? You know, and, uh, okay, that's good. What about, what's another persona? George. Curious George. Wow. And what is Curious George? He's curious about sports. He's never golfed before, but he, you know, his doctor told him to go out and get some exercise. All right. So he wants to go and he says, well, you know, some of my friends golf. Maybe golfing would be fun. So I'm going to go and I'm going to, you know, get some golf equipment and, and go and try it out. Or fill in the blank. Any other? Kyle the kayaker needs to buy some paddles. Okay, Kyle the kayaker <laughs> needs to... I, I think Kyle the kayaker that needs to buy some paddles is closely related. It's probably the boyfriend of... Emily the Enthusiast or Extreme Enthusiast because that seems like a very niche sort of, of, of thing. Uh, anything else? Can you Coach Carl, that was the one I was waiting for, the one more. Coach Carl, of course. Coach Carl that coaches a uh, CYO basketball team, a high school basketball team, whatever, and is maybe looking for a deal on... Um, you know, athletic apparel for his team. All right. So, it wasn't too hard to come up with things. Now, to be sure, some of those people, some of those people, their goals are going to overlap. But there's also going to be some distinct goals. Um, soccer mom Sarah, unless she's, I don't know, what's the name of that family on TV that has 19 kids? 
the Duggars, yeah, unless, unless it's, it's, it's her, pro, uh, no, uh, no one other than Coach Carl probably cares about like quantity discounts, you know, whereas Coach Carl would, would care about that. Um, some of the high-end people might be looking at, you know, uh, some very niche items, some very specific uh, items that are outside the realm of the ordinary. Like Kyle. Like, like Kyle, exactly. Right. All right. Yeah. So, at any rate, they may have some similar goals. They may have some goals that are different. Again, you're not going to hit on every single person and in the world and their goals, but you can do a better job than just saying a user to a sporting goods store. Because you think of that, we have a nameless, faceless person, and we don't really have an idea of what their goals are beyond the sort of obvious they will probably want to buy some sporting goods. All right? What about, like, for a band? What are some things for a band? What would be some personas for the band? For, uh, for, uh, for the audience of a band? Yeah. And audience of a band slash visitors to their website. Fan, well, well, I don't know. I'm here. I'm hearing some. I'm hearing some. Okay, someone looking to hire a band. All right, would be would be one. Hiring Harry that runs Harry's Bar and Grill. <laughs> All right, what would another one be? A listener. A music fan. I, I kind of like these, but I kind of really want to get a little more specific on them. Well, again, we, we can kind of put those on the... Yeah. Uh, and again, this is where, yeah, you know, there would be Harry hiring the band for um, a bar gig. There would be um, Sue and Joe hiring it for a wedding. We can kind of put all these people into the hiring Harry category, all right? What's, what's a different, a specific fan, a high school kid? And what, what, and what I want to focus on is you said that that is a fan, all right? In other words, they know the band, they know the band's music, and they like it already. So that would be a second persona. Yeah, so they want news updates. They want to know, depending on the kind of band, you know, they want to know what the band members' favorite colors are and what their breakfast cereal was and all that. I know a lot of jazz fans are interested in all that uh, with, uh, with uh, the musicians they like. All right? So there you have a case of, of again, someone is hiring a band. You know what? Their personal taste may come into play, but there might be other factors coming in, like how much the band's going to charge. Do I think my audience is going to like this band? You know, if I was hiring a... Uh, if I was hiring a band for uh, a wedding or for an event, I'm not necessarily going to pick my favorite musicians. I'm going to pick a band that I think is going to appeal to the people that are coming to that and play all the classic wedding songs and whatever. Uh, just hire a DJ, right? Oh, yeah. What would another persona be? Curious George again. Right. Yeah, someone, yeah, uh, again, and you'll see all, a lot of these will definitely have a lot of Curious Georges in them. You know, someone that is familiar with the topic versus someone that knows just a very little about it. So Curious George, their friend, they saw a sticker on their friend's car, and they know that they like the same music, and um, there's, you know, uh, they saw a picture in the newspaper. The, the the lead singer has a great flaming skull tattoo with barbed wire wrapped around its head and all that. And I'm into that kind of music, so uh, I, I want to give them a listen. 
All right. So again, someone that would be curious, someone that maybe had heard about them and maybe recommended by a friend or heard like a song or something like that and wants to delve in some more. So it's not hard to do to come up with three personas. So I'm asking you to do that for this. Think of the three personas. All right. And that is the first section, the strategy section, sort of an overview a definition of the goals and the personas. Let's look up. All right, here is a listing of that. We've talked about the first section right here. This never fails to confuse me that I scroll down to have it go sideways. Strategy, we define a description of the site's purpose, a priority list of three goals, that and that. All right. The next section is called the requirements section or the scope section. So the first section we talked about is the strategy. The second we talk about is the scope. In the scope section, in the scope section, we look at what we're going to do to try to achieve those goals. So we define goals. We define goals for us. We define goals for our users. Then in the scope section, we say what we're going to do to achieve those goals. All right? Now, almost any goal can be achieved a couple different ways. All right? Let's talk about a very straightforward one. A store that wants to sell more goods. That's their goal. How, how could that goal be achieved? Okay. Have a sale, reduce prices, and hopefully people will buy more stuff. In more general terms, you can sell more by A, bringing more customers in, B, getting your current customers to buy more, all right, like you're at Burger King, you know, do you want to turn that into a uh, Big Mac <laughs> Happy Meal or whatever, right? Where you, yeah, I, I think I messed that up. Probably not, a, probably not at Burger King, right? But the idea is, is you go in and order a burger, what do they do? They try to upsell you, all right? So one way to sell more would be to try to attract more people to come to you, all right? Steal from your competition, get more people to come there. Another would be try to get your current customers to buy more. A third would be to maybe open up a brand new set of customers, all right? And you'll see that by McDonald's having things like, oh, you know, we don't just sell McChicken, you know, that's made out of God knows what. Yeah, it was the McRib, right, right. We sell healthy stuff. You can order a salad or what, what, what is it? The, the ca yeah, the Cafe Mickey D's or whatever it's called. Yeah, and, and that's an attempt to people that like, well, gee, I don't go to McDonald's. Well, wait a minute. Oh, now, now McDonald's is a cool cafeteria where I can hear beat poets recite poetry, you know, and I don't know. Well, they try to give that feel by saying the Mick Cafe, coffee house, whatever. All right. Okay. So, the point is, is almost any goal that you have, you could achieve a variety of different ways. What you do in the requirements section is you specify what specific pieces of content you're going to have they're going to help you achieve that goal. 
All right. Let's look at my example. All right. I'm saying I'm going to have biographies of contemporary musicians and jazz masters of the past. Each biography will consist of general information, a description of the music's career, playing style, a list of musicians that have influenced this musician, a list of musicians this musician has played with, a list of musicians that this musician has influenced, one or two audio clips, links to Amazon for one or two of the best recordings, and so on. Pardon me? Affiliate links, exactly. Now, we could actually do this, and I didn't do this. This is why I'd knock off a couple points on my grading of myself here. But we could actually go and match up the requirements to the goal. For example, links to Amazon for one or two best recordings. That relates specifically to the goal of get information that would help them assist in buying, uh, building a jazz library. So I could, that's, that's what I started to do here, I have a U3 there. I could actually go and put, oh, I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. You're going to put U3 next to this. And in that way you can make sure all your requirements map to a goal. Alright? All your requirements, all the things that you've put in there, should relate to a goal. By the same token, every one of your goals should map to at least one requirement. If you think about it, it makes sense. If I've defined something as one of my six most important goals, I better have something on the site that relates to it. So, I've identified to give an overview of the whole history of jazz. If there was nothing in my requirements that talked about having information about musicians of the past, then I clearly haven't addressed that goal. So, every goal should correspond to at least one requirement, and every requirement should correspond to at least one goal. A goal that doesn't have any requirements You've identified something as very important, and yet you have not associated anything with it that is going to help achieve that. A requirement without a goal is like, why do I need this? This is only going to get in the way, and it's going to clutter. Um, you know, if I had a set of links to musician, mu uh, um, um, musical instrument manufacturers, for example, all right? That doesn't really relate to any of my goals. Why do it? If anything, that will just clutter, uh, clutter the page, cloud the situation, and make it harder for people all right, to achieve their goals. So I should be able to just side by side put the goals and requirements and Put the requirement number less next to the goal, put the goal number next to the requirement, and it's not a necessarily a one-to-one, -one, but every goal should have at least one requirement, every requirement should correspond to at least one goal. These again, these requirements should not be general web design principles, like a requirement is to have good navigation. No, that's implied. You need to do that. Um, to be sure, but that's not a goal. That's not why people are coming to your site. All right. The next step is to come up with a structure of your site. When I define my requirements here, I haven't really said how many pages I'm going to have. I've just said I want to have this content on my site. 
I haven't said, do I have one gigantic page that has all this content on it? Do I have... Yeah, exactly. Uh, do I have a couple of pages? You know, are things organized, um, you know, by year, by style? What are they organized by? In the structure phase, you go and you break down how you're going to organize the content into pages. All right? Now, for simple websites like ours, you're probably going to have a simple hierarchy. Simple hierarchy is where you have a home page and you have pages underneath that. You might, in some cases, have pages underneath those. Yes, yeah, tier one, tier two, and so on. All right. Like so many other aspects of design, it's a balancing act. All right. If you have too many things on this tier, then you look and you say, well, I'm then given a choice of 50 items to pick. I have to look through all 50 of them. If you have a couple items on here and have 15 tiers, then you have to click down 15 times to get to where you're, you're going to. So balancing between your design in terms of the width of your hierarchy versus the depth is something that's important. For most of your sites, it's going to be a simple hierarchy. There are other sort of um, um, layouts or, or, or structures for sites, like a sequential, where one page has to come after another. You don't really see that too much because that's sort of the antithesis of the web, right? I mean, the whole idea of the web is that you can navigate around. But there are some pages like FAFSA and whatever that it takes you through in a certain order. Yes? Yes. Right. Right. In other words, what you'd be doing is you'd be organizing these guys into categories. Yeah, you, you absolutely could do that. For most of your projects, you're going to have a simple hierarchy. And again, you're going to have, I forget what the requirements say. It's in one of the documents, you know, five to nine pages, something like that, seven to nine, something like that. Now, the one thing that, besides that, is your site needs to have what's called an organizing principle. All right? It's sort of the basic way that the information on the site is structured. So if I look at my case, I'm feeling like that is not getting any bigger. For those of you that can't see, I have home, and then underneath it I have by musical instrument. I have trumpet, saxophone, piano, bass, drums, other. Then I have an index and a set of links. And I've sort of given the rationale why I could do it. Now, you could argue this to be sure. But my rationale was like this that people that aren't familiar with jazz are not necessarily going to know the decade that music came from. So they're not going to say, I like the style that was played in the 40s. All right, or I like the style that was played in the 50s. If I were to do it by the kind of, the style of jazz, all right, again, people that are not familiar with jazz music might not really know to call this like West Coast jazz or um, this, you know, uh, uh, New Orleans style or whatever. If I did it by time frame, what do you do with a musician that started in the 40s and is still playing till, till now, you know? It's confusing, you know? 
does, does, you know, Sonny Rollins, a great jazz musician, does he belong in, say, the 40s and 50s when he started playing? Does he belong in the current day because he's still alive and making great music? Or does he fit into the decades where he played his best music? And in which case, you know, right, yeah, that gets to be a little much for the novice. So you know what? Above anything else, a novice should be able to um, identify, gee, I like the way the piano sounds. I like the way saxophones sound. I like the way trumpet sound. I like a band with a good drummer, and so on. So as far as my organizing principle, I chose that specifically going back to looking at my personas and thinking what would work for them. All right? Does Mary know what kind of jazz was played in the 30s? No, Mary doesn't know. So if I did things chronologically, probably wouldn't do her any good. All right? We have two more sections, and I'm going to go for it and finish it out, because who knows? what the future holds. Wow, that sounded scarier than I intended. Yeah, the next, so we, we've seen so far, strategy. That's the goals. We've seen requirements or scope. That's the list of things that we're going to have on the site that support those goals. We've seen structure, which is how the site's going to be organized. Next is called skeleton, and it is one or more than one wireframe. What's a wireframe? A wireframe is a high-level sketch of how the page is going to look. This is a wireframe. That's a wireframe. It doesn't go into details about what's going to be in there, but it points out the major sections of the page. How many wireframes do you think you might have for a small site like this? Maybe one? Maybe two? More than two, you might want to think about it. You might be creating more work for yourself. All right? The whole idea is, is we have sites these sites are simple enough and have few enough pages in them that you want it to have a consistent look, but there might be a page or two that are a little unusual. Your home page you might have a different layout for. All right? Or you might have a gallery page that has a different look to it. But in general, for a small section of pages, one of these could very well be enough, or maybe two of them. Remember when we looked at LC's site the last time, we actually found that there were pretty much three layouts. There was a home page layout, there was a section layout for like current students, potential students, and so on, and then finally there was a content page layout. So you'll come up with at least one of these, possibly two. If you're doing more than two, you might want to think about it. All right. Lastly is the prototype, and the prototype is sort of like a rough draft of some of the pages, and you need to turn that in when you turn in the design. So you'll create some of the pages, some of the CSS. doesn't have to be perfect, just like a rough draft in English class doesn't have to be perfect, but it should show what direction you're going. All right? You can have all, all the documentation that comes previous to that is very important. 
But for most people that you're dealing with, they want to look at the prototype because they want to see what they have. And, and by seeing it, it sort of jumps out at them. All right. Why do you create this documentation? You do it to plan, to figure out what you're going to do. And you also do it to share with other people. And the prototype by actually showing them how the pages are going to look and how they navigate doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be finalized, um, is a good way to indicate that. So the prototype section, which I did not do in my example, which we'll pick up on next time, creating a prototype, um, is, again, critical because that's how people are going to look at it and... and how complete should the prototype be? Well, it's hard to say, right? You want to give the user a good idea of what it's going to look like, but you don't necessarily want to do the entire site and have the user say, hey, I want to change it completely around. So you do enough of it so that they can make a judgment, um, but not so much that you um, are doing too much work if they tell you to throw away the whole thing and start from scratch. All right. Next time, the focus of the lecture will be turning your wireframe into a prototype. And that's where we'll pick up on next time. Any questions? North Ridgeville, okay. All right. Did you have a question in North Ridgeville? No? Okay. <laughs>